Sunday Showcase, highlighting some of the best audio storytelling found anywhere. All right here on the Mutual Audio Network. Hello, my name is Richard Fish. What you're about to hear is a pretty amazing piece of audio, and a lot of us think this is a really good time for it to be heard. The original version of this script was written and produced in one week by Norman Corwin, the Grand Master of American Radio Theater. It was conceived at a moment when America was deeply divided, polarized over vastly important issues, life and death issues, whether to participate in the Second World War. Norman's idea was to try and lower the temperature of the rhetoric, to consider where we all stand on common ground, to remember what we are all proud of and want to keep, what it is about our country that is worth preserving and defending. Ray Collins headlined the first broadcast on July 6, 1941, and then Orson Welles broadcast it again, bringing the country together on the infamous evening of December 7th after the attack on Pearl Harbor. It's not a lecture. It doesn't try to tell you how to think, but it does try to get you thinking so you can make up your own mind. Today, we have a new version of this program, and that was Norman's idea, too. Twenty years ago, after the horror of 9-11, he decided that this concept needed to be heard again, and he asked me to help him update the script for a 21st century audience. We worked on that together for years, and finally achieved an approach we thought would work. But before a broadcast could be arranged, Norman passed away, unexpectedly, at the age of 101. The script we're using now has had some further tweaks to its wording. A lot of wonderful people, especially younger people, have read it and offered wise and insightful suggestions. But the tweaks have not changed the basic message Norman wanted to convey. I have been careful to ask myself, what would Norman do all along as we created this production? It presents a range of views, but you'll be told right up front that you don't have to agree with any of them if you don't want to. This is America, after all. The program asks some important questions, but does not necessarily answer them. The original idea, and quite a lot of the original script, still remains as it was, because anything that's been valid for 80 years is a pretty good bet to be true for a while longer. And that comes down to this. If we stop shouting at each other and start listening, if we first identify where we agree and then look at things from that perspective, if we remember that every time we've worked together over the last two and a half centuries we've accomplished wonderful things, we all stand a better chance of having a better future. We can find better answers. We can make better progress. We can be a better country if we can have a quiet conversation between Americans. Who was Norman Corwin? Back in the days before television, when radio was big and live and heard in every home, Norman Corwin was, well, author Ray Bradbury said it best. The best way to describe Norman Corwin is he was the greatest director, the greatest writer, and the greatest producer in the history of radio. There was no, nobody like him. Nobody could touch what he did. Corwin could and did do everything. He did drama. As it was a beautiful night, we let the horse walk slowly home. I should think it was about a quarter past eight when we got back to the farm. When I'd taken the horse out, I thought she'd go in the house. Instead of that, she made some remark about its being a beautiful moonlight night. I'd uh, pushed the trap into the coach house by this time. I stepped up on the side of the trap, reached down the revolver, and as Miss Holland stood just near the door looking at the moon, I shot her. She dropped just like a log. Then I pulled her into the coach house. If I lived to be a thousand years old, 
I shall never forget the feeling as I caught hold of both her hands and drew her along until I got her into the coach house. All kinds of things came into my mind. My heart seemed almost stand still as I put my hand inside her dress to feel if her heart was beating. He did comedy. Now, uh, who is here for the defense? I am, Your Honor. Well, commence. I will. I do so. Now you see, sir. I see nothing of the sort. Who's paying you your fee, sir? No one at all. The way it is with me, sir, I'm acting out of interest in civil liberty, sir. What's liberty to do with it, if you will be so kind? Just this. Where in the universal law books can you find it's criminal for anything to be of open mind? The precedent is ample. It is. Let's have a sample. Blackstone on the elements. Case of bismuth versus molybdenum. All drat the books. Our legal forebears doubtlessly all fibbed in them. Hold on there, you, uh, you upstart. Is not the horse before the cart? Where would we be without tradition? In some advanced, improved position. What? What? Young man, are you a red... Have you been to the crimson bread? Neither to crimson nor to purple. Well, no whipper-snapping twiple. Challenge me. What do you take me for? A most distinguished expert on the law. Hmm. Quite sensible thing you've said today. He imagined fantasy. Don't you realize that I'm very busy? Yes, Father Time, but it won't take you long to tell me whether... Quiet, quiet. I've got to listen for the time signals. Ah, ah, that means that the eclipse of three moons on Jupiter was right on time. Uh, He was a little dog about so... When you hear the time signal, it will be exactly half past 162 on Uranus. Shucks, that was 37 thousandths of a second late. I must make a note of that. We'd have to make it up in the year 7,302. Well, now, what are you doing here? Don't you remember, Father Time? I'm the one who's looking for my dog. I think... Oh, yes, yes. Well, um, the only one that I know who could possibly help you is M.N. M.N.? Listen, don't you know anything, lad? Mother Nature. He could take you back into history. How about Alexander Hamilton? I'm sorry to take you over the bumps like this, but I have to be at a meeting, and this is the only time I could see you. Well, it's good of you to see me at all, Mr. Hamilton. This carriage seems to have lost a spring. (laughs) I, I hear, sir, that you have some reservations about the Constitution. You heard correctly. As it stands, I don't think the Constitution will last. It's frail at best, but it's necessary. It's a vital compromise between those who, like myself, believe a strong central government is absolutely indispensable and others who tremble at the idea of a state surrendering the slightest bit of sovereignty to federal authority. Mm -hmm. Isn't it possible to reconcile the two positions? Afraid not. There'll always be controversy over interpretation of the Constitution. It'll be open to many amendments and amendments to amendments, We have no reason to expect peace and cordiality among the states. Uh, Then you're against ratification. Where did you get that idea? I'm working for ratification. Ah. I dread the consequences of the Constitution not being adopted. But even if it is, it's not going to usher in a golden age. All it can do is to give us a breathing spell. To resist the factionalism, suspicion, and jealousy that's bound to develop between the states. Pressures that could tear us apart one day and lead to disunion and civil war. Uh. Well, uh, I'd like to say more on this, but here we are. It's been good talking to you, Mike. My coach will take you wherever you wish to go. Thank you, sir. Thank you, General. And almost everyone you've ever heard of appeared in his programs. Here are just a few of them. You have been listening to Elsa Lanchester. Edward G. Robinson, Corporal James Stewart, Orson Welles. Groucho Marx. Olivia de Havilland. Hans Conrad. Charles Lawton. Ronald Coleman, James Earl Jones, Esther Roll, Lloyd Bridges, Jesse White, Edward Asner, Thess Parker, Studs Terkel, Ray Bradbury, Norman Lear, Jack Lemon as Aaron Burr, Lloyd Bridges as Alexander Hamilton, William Shatner as Thomas Jefferson, and Martin Landau as John Lennox. Carl Reiner, Walter Cronkite, Louis Nye, Edward R. Murrow, Benjamin Britten. 
President Franklin Delano Roosevelt spoke from the White House in Washington, D.C. Today, Norman Lewis Corwin is known as the Grand Master of American Radio Theater and has inspired a great many people, like movie director Robert Altman. Anything I know about drama today comes from more from, from Norman Corwin than anybody. And broadcaster Charles Corralt. I remember first reading Norman Corwin when I was 13 years old. Corwin hit me right between the eyes. It was a revelation of what writing could be. He was the first writer who opened up the world to me. But all that would have surprised him and his family very much if they'd known about it when he was born in Boston back in 1910. Not because the art form didn't exist. Audio theater was already almost 20 years old but it was only heard on recordings, cylinders, and Berliner discs in three- or four-minute novelty pieces and vaudeville sketches. Broadcast radio didn't exist. I think that I uh, felt a yen to tell stories when I was a kid and to listen to stories and to read stories. When I was a kid, Steve, there was no television, and radio had not been on the scene very long, and the stately pleasure dome in the home were books. Mm -hmm. And there was a great deal of excitement about that, and I remember my first visit to the library as a kid being full of excitement because here was, here was an entree to uh, words that carried me beyond the, anything in the parameters of, of a child's life. Corwin actually started his working career in another profession, print journalism. I was a newspaper man at the age of 17 uh, and uh, w remained one for 10 years. I uh, began as a reporter on a small town daily, then went to a larger city, which was Springfield, Massachusetts. I then went to New York as a publicity flack for 20th Century Fox. This is in the Depression years. Anything to get away from my $32.10 a week job in, in Springfield. He spent some years dutifully turning out copy loaded with superlatives about the studio's productions and its stars and had great fun turning those memories into satire years later in a program he called The Movie Primer. T. T stands for Titanic. What is Titanic? Titanic is the great comparative adjective of motion pictures. By consulting figure 16, you will see that the scale ranges upward from the lousy picture, technically known as micro-Titanic, to the ultimate zenith. And between the two, there are 13 gradations. The scale is as follows. Micro-Titanic. Mini-Titanic. Sub-Titanic. Demi-Titanic. Neo-Titanic. Mid-Titanic. Titanic. Sesqui-Titanic. Super-Titanic. Super-Colossal-Titanic. Megalo-Titanic. Titanic-Titanic. Titanic-Titanic-Titanic. Tetra-Titanic. A David O. Selznick production! And then through a series of coincidences, too complex, too strung out to burden you with, uh, I came to the attention of a man uh, he was then program manager at CBS, a man named William B. Lewis, and he uh, invited me over to CBS to talk about the uh, possibility of coming with that network. And so from a, a, a portfolio as a publicity flack on uh, West 44th Street, I suddenly found myself on Madison Avenue and 52nd Street, in the citadel of broadcasting known as... What year was this? 38. Commercial radio was becoming bigger every year, and the national networks were building enormous audiences. In 1941, they gave him a half hour on the network every week and told him he had carte blanche to do anything he liked. He wouldn't have to worry about a sponsor, the network would pay for everything and open all its resources to him, including the CBS orchestra. There was only one instruction, no series. No serial stories, no continuing characters. Each program must be different from all the others. It would last 26 weeks without a break, and it was called 26 by Corwin. How would you like to take over that program for 26 weeks? And uh, I was agog, 
but here I was being offered a great opportunity. Then he added, let's call it 26 by Corwin. Well, I left his office beaming, but when I got home, I thought, what have I done? Mm -hmm. Because this means writing and directing and producing a program a week, having nothing to do with the program that preceded or followed it. And uh, how am I going to do that uh, and, and have time to shave and, uh, and take a shower? But I was committed, and of course I had no lead time, and it was, uh, it was a strain, but I loved it, and I was able to do it because I loved it. Norman Lear expressed the ongoing astonishment of everyone who has heard these programs. I am a writer, and I like the way I write, but I can't write a television script every week. And I am a, have learned to become a terrific collaborator. That wasn't so with Norman Cohen. He wrote what he wrote himself. How he did it every week, I could no more explain to you than uh, to tell you how he was made chemically. I mean, it's a wonder to me, that output. is an absolute wonder, and the quality of that output. A typical work week at CBS in the days when I was doing a series like 26 by Corwin, uh, consisted of a kind of monastic life. Fortunately for me, I loved what I was doing. And I, I was not conscious of it being a very great sacrifice when I gave up going to parties and going to movies and going to plays and dating. And I hide me to my self-made monastery. I was so enchanted and intrigued and challenged by the necessity to come up with a new program every week that uh, it was a great game to me, and I loved it. And I did not resent the fact that, that uh, immediately after a broadcast, I had to, on the ride home from the studio, I'd have to think, what am I going to write next week? Of course, one of those programs was Between Americans, the program which has been updated for 2021. America was extremely divided, polarized, over the question of getting involved in the Second World War, which was already raging. For his July 4th weekend show, Corwin made his appeal for America to tone down the rhetoric and remember what we all love about our country. I have kept up a frequent correspondence with Norman, mostly by email. It was a joy to receive his messages and to write to him. There wasn't any reference or joke I could possibly think of that he wouldn't get. But he hadn't really known me as a creative person, as a writer or a performer, so it was a heart-stopping shock when he asked me to collaborate on updating Between Americans. We worked on that script for some years. Norman died unexpectedly at the age of 101. And like the rest of his life, that's both amazing and quite true. His older brother Emil lived to 108, and their father survived to 110. So we hoped Norman was going to be around for at least a little while longer. But he's not gone. His work is still here. His thoughts and his dreams and his insights are still here. And when I finally got the chance to do a production of Between Americans 2021, it turns out to be even more timely than it would have been during his lifetime. Frankly, I wonder if that might be something he arranged. The following audio drama is rated PG for parental guidance. This program is Between Americans. That's where the title comes in. We hope you like it, but you don't have to. At any rate, nobody's going to make you stick around and listen to it. That's one of the advantages of being an American. <laughs> we invite you to think that one over for a moment, and while you're exercising your inalienable right to tune us out or let us ride, we'll help ourselves to a little music. Maestro, the overture, please.
Now, that was an American composition, but boy, it sure did go all over the map, didn't it? But then, mixing in different strains has never bothered real Americans. Not when we've got states named after French kings and English queens, or lifted right out of the Spanish language, like Nevada, or out of ancient Latin, like Montana. Or take Vermont. That's French for Green Mountain. For, for Green, Mont, for Mountain. They call it the Green Mountain State, don't they? You know, if we were to hold a convention of all the people who live in foreign-sounding American towns, we could fill quite a sizable stadium. Among the delegates registering on the first day would be... Me. I'm the delegate from London. Minnesota. I'm in from Dublin, California. Who's turn? Me? I'm from Rome, Mississippi. And I'm from Tokyo, Texas. I came all the way from Shanghai, West Virginia. And I live in Manila... Utah. I'm here from Goshen, Indiana. And I hope you don't mind, my wife's deployed overseas, so I brought our son with me. Hello. Oh, sorry, ma'am. I didn't mean to get in front of you. That's all right. I'm the delegate representing Geneva, Washington State. My town is Toronto, Kansas. As for me, Lisbon, Maine. Delegate from Madrid, Alabama, reporting. My parents brought me from Stockholm, South Dakota. Flew in this afternoon from Bombay, New York. I drove here from Baghdad, Florida. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. You may all be seated. Now that's all the preliminaries there's going to be tonight. We're through with the introduction, the overture, and the official registration. So now we can get down to the text, which is, roughly speaking, this. People are thinking about their country pretty hard these days, some of them for the first time in their lives. People are wondering where we're headed, and being Americans, nobody can make them agree with anybody about everything or with everybody about anything. There's always been plenty of dissent in our country. It was founded by people who disagreed with their government, after all. And these days, arguments have been getting pretty loud and extremely passionate. Wherever you are, you can probably find people right in your own town who take a very different view of some very important things. Just what does America mean to them and to you? Most Americans are solid patriots, only they don't know it. They don't have to wear a a red, white, and blue cap to prove it or, or come to attention every time they hear a patriotic tune. They don't have to agree with or even listen to people like this. And you know that this is the only place you're going to really hear the truth because I always tell the truth and you know that. And you know I'm right. I'm always right. And the rights that we have are the rights I stand on. Where would America be without this great country of ours? It's self-evident. We've got a good hunch. Most people prefer the quiet kind of speaker. Like, well, like the fellow who got up on a platform in a Pennsylvania town one day and said... The world will little note, nor long remember, what we say here. That was the Gettysburg Address, carved in marble today. As a matter of fact, it didn't get such good reviews the next morning. (laughs) Take, for example, the write-up in the Harrisburg Patriot. We pass over the silly remarks of the President. For the credit of the nation, we are willing they shall no more be repeated and thought of. If you think that's bad, listen to what the Chicago Times had to say. The cheek of every American must tingle with shame as he reads the silly, flat, and dishwatery utterances of the man who has to be pointed out to intelligent foreigners as the President of the United States. Of course, the rival paper in Chicago, the Tribune, took the opposite point of view. Rival papers often do. The remarks of President Lincoln will live among the annals of men. The trip gave it four stars, and they were right. The Gettysburg Address did survive. Now, that business of calling a president silly is really something to be proud of. I mean, the right to print a piece, saying a president makes a sound like dishwater? That's important. Nobody dragged those editors off to jail, even if they were wrong. Comes under the heading of free press. As soon as anybody starts gagging the press in any medium, watch out, Americans don't like that. 
And we've got a nerve to be calling ourselves Americans all the time when we're really only United Staters. We're a little selfish about that. Do you know that a citizen of Punta Arenas on the Strait of Magellan has as much right to America the Beautiful as you have? <laughs> If any of you folks hear this program down in Mexico or Chile or up in Quebec or even if you're an Inuit in the Arctic, we hope you'll overlook our calling ourselves Americans as though we're the only ones in the hemisphere. We do that just because it's so much easier to say than anything else and also because it sounds so good. But before we leave the subject, what about the original Americans, the Native Americans? If we're going to be honest, their story doesn't sound so good. The peoples of the First Nations, who were here before any lines were drawn, are brave peoples, too often confronted with hatred, bigotry, and broken promises, and even shot down, starved out, and violently forced into exile by the waves of newcomers arriving from all over the world. They've been fighting a losing fight against great odds. The fight so many people of all countries have had to fight. The fight to keep their lives from being lived in fear. Today, we are all attacked by people who are trying to shove fear right in our faces. We call them terrorists, and we don't always know where they're coming from, in any sense of that phrase. But back during the Great Depression, a president of the United States said something we still remember. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Today, those who weaponize fear know that well, and they also know something the brilliant Chinese strategist Sun Tzu wrote 25 centuries ago. One who knows the enemy and knows himself will not be endangered in a hundred engagements. One who does not know the enemy but knows himself will sometimes be victorious, sometimes meet with defeat. One who knows neither the enemy nor himself will invariably be defeated. You see what that means. If we want to defend ourselves against any attacker, we've got to know the truth about ourselves. That means asking some questions, hard questions, about what kind of people Americans really are. Would anybody care to try? I would. Haven't Americans committed acts which even we would call terrorism? Yes, we have. More often than we like to admit. Sometimes abroad, but sometimes right here at home. Yes. I was thinking of mass shootings. Of kids in school, even. Kids like me. Wow. Oh, this isn't something scary. you should even have to mm, think about. Horrible. That's, that's one of the worst terrible. Terrible. Best terrorism. That is straight really up. Have you ever had anything else. like oh, that no. when I was growing wow. up? Someone yeah. should be able to do something about oh. that. That's awful. Oh, well, we won't stop it. Hey, what do we regulate? Do you think about it. That kind of thing happened. Oh, there's nothing to say but shame. Just horrible. Oh, yes, horrible. But let me give you an even worse example. The first five generations of Americans lived in a country that officially permitted slavery. Slavery based on race. An evil so great that we are still trying to purge its insidious miasma from the minds of our children. In order to uproot that evil, we had to tear our country in half and fight a war that cost us far more in blood and treasure than any other war we've ever fought. But we did it. It was historian George Santayana who said, Those who do not remember history are condemned to repeat it. I've heard that said. Here's what I say. September 11, 2001. There's some history we don't ever want to repeat. Remember Pearl Harbor? September 11th has been compared many times to December 7th, 1941. And what was World War II, really, but a war against terror? What were the Nazis and the Japanese militarists and all their also-ran imitators but terrorists? Terrorists who controlled whole countries. Hundreds of thousands marched to their tombs, brandishing weapons and gas chambers. Tens of millions believed their monstrous lies. 
Those terrorists had armies, navies, air forces, industries, banks filled with the loot of nations. Terror weapons? Oh, they had them all. Suicide bombers? The Japanese launched thousands of kamikazes. Chemical weapons? The Nazis stockpiled tons of nerve gas. But even they were afraid to unleash that horror. Biological weapons? The Japanese had special bombs filled with bubonic plague and anthrax. They were ready to use them on us, but never did. Nuclear weapons? The Nazis had a design for a dirty bomb and the materials to make it. Lucky for us, they didn't get it done in time. Lucky for us. Pearl Harbor and 9-11 together killed 6,000 Americans, and we will never forget. But the war against history's worst terrorists devastated the world and cost us in America over a million casualties, more than 400,000 dead, defending our liberties. We'll never forget that either. We gave up some of our liberties to fight that war, didn't we? Well, yes, we did. For the duration. Of the war, that is. Like some freedom of speech and information. Lots of things were secret. Radio stations weren't even allowed to broadcast a weather report. But reporters still did their best to report the truth as they saw it about what was going on. In wartime, people could accept things like that. But then we pretty much canceled the Bill of Rights for more than 100,000 Japanese Americans, not just legal immigrants, full citizens too, and forced them into internment camps for the duration, to be sure. What do you all think of that? <sighs> oh. Look, after Pearl Harbor, people were afraid some of those Japanese folks would be uh, spies or, uh, what's the word, uh, saboteurs, you know? Terrorists. And we weren't marching them into gas chambers or anything. If those people had food and clothing and housing, families could stay together. And the kids even had schools. Oh, come on. Those crummy houses didn't even have plumbing. They had a hard life and it wasn't right. The Supreme Court finally said it was unconstitutional. Oh, yes, and they were released in 1945, and eventually we officially apologized and even gave $20,000 to each one we could find. Decades later. Those are all just excuses. It happened because we were afraid. Afraid of people just because of how they were born. Because they were different. Seems to me Roosevelt was right. The only thing we have to fear really is fear itself. At least it teaches everybody a lesson African Americans have always known. It can happen here. When the Second World War was over, over there, we said this over here. We've learned that freedom isn't something to be won and then forgotten. It must be renewed like soil after yielding good crops, must be rewound like a faithful clock, exercised like a healthy muscle. Free men who forget that lose their freedom. Do we still remember today how to exercise our freedom and keep it healthy? It's not hard. Not really. We just have to do a little civil thinking every day. Pay attention. Don't just glance at a headline. Get the whole story. And make up your own mind. Don't just decide who you're going to believe. Find out what the facts are and think about them. Yes, trying to understand what's really true and what isn't. That's everybody's job. And so's using our freedom of speech. Shoot your mouth off against the bad appointment or the stupid zoning decision. Or sneaky ways to keep people from voting. Standing up against hate speech. Insisting that bad laws be changed. And good ones enforced. Voting in season. And demanding of our representatives that they be representative. If we don't do it, who will? That's a good question. It reminds me of something that's been said by a lot of different people, including Emma Lazarus, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, and, and perhaps most famously by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. No one is free until we all are free. 
Well, we've made some progress on that, haven't we? I mean, Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation over 150 years ago. But it took another century before we passed the Voting Rights Act. And it's not just about African Americans. Let me remind you that in Lincoln's day, a wife was still considered to be the property of her husband. American women, half the population, weren't allowed to vote for another 50 years. That's true. We have made some progress, and we shouldn't forget that. But we still have more to do, and we shouldn't forget that either. So, here's another good question. Americans will always defend their homes and families, but these days, are we really willing to take the time and do whatever needs doing to defend freedom for every American? Hmm. I do not yeah, think so. about that. I, it's a good oh. question. Well, it depends on what you mean by freedom, doesn't it? Well, it's so well, hard to answer. Well, I would like to better. Know. We're in this trouble. world today, what people are living in such a selfish, <sighs> selfish way. That's I'm not sure Americans are defending the freedom of every American. I don't know. Maybe just Americans that look like them. Would you consider someone you don't agree with? someone you would fight for. We have to consider the bigger picture. Is everyone going to be protected? There's a lot to think about. <laughs> Which freedoms are we talking no, about? That's a, that's a tough Sometimes question. Sometimes you just don't know. We have to take care of each other. Are we Americans today less brave than the defenders of Valley Forge, Little Round Top, Bellow Wood, Bastogne, Poussin, Quezon, or Kabul? I don't think Absolutely so. Absolutely not. No, 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 I don't think no. no. that we can. My wife is an example of our so military much is being have to ask We're Our military is just as brave as they've ever I been. I wonder about they that. They put their lives on the line every day. Americans are not any less brave today than they've but always been. But it's not been. the same. I think same. they have so it in us. We're as brave as we ever are. There's a lot more. I don't think we've gone less. You'll find some of the bravest people in our inner cities and in our rural communities. I guess we'd have to think about that. Are we less hardy nowadays than the people who endured in Coventry or Manila or Stalingrad? Jeez, I, I don't not. know. Maybe. I have a hard time picturing that. That's a hard one. I don't know. Sure, but I wouldn't like to think we would. Well, I think I don't we're know. all a little softer. I don't think we so are less hard nowadays. Hard to I don't tell, know. really. We I, haven't I, had to I, do that. We have that. gone through so, so much. We as Americans, we like the easy way, not the hard way. I think that people rise to the situation that they're in. I think as a, as a nation, we would come together and... We would do that. We would keep going. We've forgotten how to endure through yeah. the hard I stuff. I think we give ourselves... Don't worry about Not enough credit. We'll get you We could get it back again, though. Absolutely. Pulling together. Back. It's hard to tell if you've not numbers. been through any of those tragedies. History will always throw challenges at I'm us. I'm not sure. But I, I hope we never have to. In this new millennium, are we less dedicated to doing what's right than Ben Franklin or Harriet Tubman or Viola Liuzzo? Heavens no. I don't know. I don't think so. Yeah. We are less dedicated in doing what's right. I think it's hard. Sadly. I think it depends on who you're thinking of as we. You know, I used to say no, but I have hope these days. I don't think we're less dedicated. I think that well, what's right um, looks different to different people. Not everyone has disagreed on what right is. Is what's right based on a lie well, or based on the truth? Huh. Well, you know, uh, these days, I'm not so sure. I think we have as strong convictions now, because if you look at all the young people that are protesting, you look at all the things that are being reformed. Well, sure. Uh, I Look guess at what so. happens when people find a cause and something to join each other to rise up against or in favor of. We are more dedicated than when ever. When we think we are doing right, we defend it to the mat. I think our conviction is just as strong as in the past, I guess. It was Ben Franklin who wrote way back in 1759, Those who would give up essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. I have not heard that one before, but I like it. I agree entirely with that statement. Pretty yeah. stark. Pretty that's harsh. A good one. Pretty <laughs> true. Yeah, yeah that's boy, right. that's a true. Ben was right. Look what's happening. What are we defining as our essential liberty? I mean, to me, that's the argument to keep AR-15s in people's hands. I don't know. So I disagree well, with that. That is interesting. I don't know. That, that kind of changes a few oh, things. That is a tough competition. And Ben Franklin may have been on to something. Ben was a tough I mean, old This is a man who survived the revolution. Wow. No truer words were ever spoken. Spoken. I want to agree, but then I think of my family, and I wonder. I think that same attitude should be applied to our government. I don't know how I feel about that. I don't like to think about giving up our rights. Mostly, I just like to mind my own business. Mostly, so do the rest of us. What do you suppose our rights means to that auto repairman in the grease cake jeans who works in the garage on the corner? 
It means the right to crawl under that old Buick dragging a work light after. Joe, hand me that wrench. What wrench? The socket wrench on your feet. Right there. Where? I don't see no wrench. You blind? Where are you looking? No, behind you. Oh, well, why didn't you say so? Here you go. That's more like it. Sure, that's America to Pete and Joe. The right to decide when to do a piston job, transmission job, oil change, what to charge for it, and where to go after work. And to Jane Prentice, who owns that Buick and lives down on the beach near the Coast Guard station, America means the right to enjoy the sound and the sight and the smell of high tide under the full moon. The age-old sound of the sea. The same sound folks are hearing right now up around Penobscot Bay and Marblehead, on the Chincoteague Inlet, down in St. Bernard Parish and clean over to the west coast by Guadalupe and Carmel all the way up beyond the offshore islands you can see from the Seattle Space Needle. That sure is a lot of coastline, if you're talking about something to defend. Well, look, folks, let's be honest about it. We can't build a wall around the whole country. And if we got to fight, it's a lot better to fight somewhere else over there than over here, isn't it? Yeah, I guess well, so. it's better to fight it yeah. somewhere else. Well, I don't disagree. Uh, sure. I don't know. To protect our citizens, yes. Well, Absolutely. yeah. Um, Still lots of I don't want to yeah, have people so. coming in from other countries uh, fighting a war on our land. That would be I'm afraid to go that's not what's saying. happening. Things have changed. We now have to deal with cybersecurity. Well, I guess. Your computer is something to be attacked now. That's a tough I would rather we work toward It's peace. a hard conversation. But if we can't. You know, we are fighting over here. You can't avoid it anymore. I'll say this. In both cases, you are asking Americans to die. But does that mean America has to be the policeman of the world? Uh, no, 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 that's a hard situation well, to be in. No, it's not no, our job to I tell people so. how they should be running their I don't lives. Think so. We're not the policeman of the world, but the model. Somebody's got to do it. I mean, if the UN works, I don't think us, it always right? has to be us, but sometimes you it know, helps to step up and do just the right stand thing. Stand by and do nothing, can America has to set an example. That's I think also so complicated. Every country has the responsibility of policing themselves. But we also should not allow human tragedy and human suffering to take place when it doesn't have to. I don't think that's a role anyone should have to take on, but sometimes somebody has to do the saving. That is too much power. Ah, darling, that job's too big for any one country, even us. It can't be just a single country acting like the cop on the beat. If we do it that way, one country becomes the big bully and the big target. Yeah, that's right. Hey, mister. Yes? I know just what he means. <laughs> when us kids are playing King of the Hill, if you try to stay up on top all by yourself, everybody just gangs up on you. Yeah, it's a lot easier when you got a bunch of friends up there with you, isn't it? It sure is. <laughs> but then how do you decide who wins? Oh, well, after everybody finally gets on top, we all win. <laughs> well, that's He's right, look at that, my boy. <laughs> Out of the mouth of pain. Well, that wow. seems awfully nice, but I don't know if it always works that way. It's not a that's zero sum game. That's a good way to think about it. <laughs> that's because oh. when we all win, the pie gets that's bigger. That's a great outlook exactly. on the world. That's exactly how <laughs> I think it you should be. Right idea. There it is. When everybody works together, we He's all so win. Right. That's sweet. I like the way you and your friends think. Well, sometimes you have to help the little kids up. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I like the way this kid. Kids are smaller. They need a little booster. You hear what my son said? So He's true. smarter that's than all of you. That's exactly a very kind thing to do. We should always yeah. try to do that. We all should be learning from these kids. Excuse me, but haven't we gotten off the track? Huh? Hmm. So have we really? Mm. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I don't believe you're right. Oh, I see what you mean. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I guess Can you're right. You elaborate on <laughs> then, what you mean. Okay. We've been learning from the past and worrying about the future. I mean, that's good and everything, but what about the present? We still haven't said what America is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you've got a point. Yeah, you're right. Oh, honey, the present's right, connected you know. to the past. <laughs> there there is right. Right. Somebody has that's a right. right. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Back to the big okay. question. <laughs> so we have it. If you weren't born here, or even if you were, how do you define America today? You don't do it by delving into one religion or another. Now, wait a minute. 
Religion's always been a big part of American life. So it has, in many forms. We've never even been able to count how many religions Americans have. And we've never needed to try, because our fundamental law guarantees everyone the right to believe and to worship peacefully in their own way. That's because religion was never intended to be part of American government. It was our founding fathers who put that in writing using a feathered word processor. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. The first words of the first sentence of the first article of the Bill of Rights. No, America has never been defined by religion. So how do we define what we all want to defend? Have you ever asked yourself what America means to you? Does it mean 1776, Columbia, the gem of the ocean, the Statue of Liberty, Uncle Sam? Chances are it means none of these things. Chances are it means something very personal to each of you, something close to your heart that you'd miss like the very blazes if you were stranded abroad. It might have nothing at all to do with quotes from Madison or, or acts of Congress. It might mean a course in poetry at Harvard. So it is clear that music was the key influence in what came to be called blues poetry. Now today, the influence of Langston Hughes on poets like Maya Angelou and Amanda Gorman can be seen in the rhythm of their phrasing and their choice of words. Or it could be a poker game in Charlie Ferreter's office on a rainy afternoon. See you and raise. Oi, a little rich for my blood. I'll fall. Or a skateboard and a clear stretch of sidewalk or the restaurant on the corner, or a catfish on the hook, or a song on the radio, or a great symphony orchestra playing the music of all the world's composers, including music tyrants tried and failed to forbid. There are three things about America, three great things, which taken together make our nation unique. Americans all over the country can tell you about them. First, a geography teacher from Oregon. We are a large country, third largest in the world. Did you know that? Americans tend to grow up taking, well, call it a wide perspective. Well, why don't I come up and meet you for lunch? I'll drive up today. It's only about 100 miles. Second? a businessman from a small town in the Midwest. Aside from Native Americans, of course, most of us have not descended from people who lived on this ground for many centuries, like the vast billions in other lands. Instead, we are descended from people who embraced change, who rejoiced in the future, whatever their past may have been, who left birthplaces in every land to stand on new ground. Is it an accident that hundreds of millions of people all around the world would give everything they own to be in your shoes, a free citizen of this country, right this very minute? It's no accident. It's the third of those three great things. Ask an office worker from the East Coast. It's our system of government, a system that enables all of us to get along better than any other diverse population has been able to anywhere else in the world. I'm talking about representative democracy. You know, things like elections with secret ballots and an honest count, habeas corpus, trial by jury, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, the common law, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, those things. They're the gold in the streets that people come here to find. How else can you explain Frenchmen and Germans, Hindus and Muslims, Catholics and Protestants, Serbs and Croats, Arabs and Jews, all living in the same society without killing each other, living as neighbors instead of deadly enemies? How else can you explain the fact of more than 300 million people 
trying to live up to the ideals and expectations of a handful of great men who lived and died over 200 years ago. Men who were so fed up with the kind of government they'd been getting that they stood up for their rights and then sat down and wrote a new constitution for themselves and their children. A democratic constitution. Unfortunately, we don't always live up to that document. Yeah, there's always some people trying to chisel pieces off the Constitution. And there's others who try to twist it and turn it like the devil, quoting the scriptures to his own purpose. True enough. There's some graft and greed and intolerance and lies and bigotry in our country. And a lot of things there shouldn't be. But we people, by and large, are still trying to live by the rules. Some of the best rules we've seen around, ever. Of course, there are other things that make our union such a good one to belong to. It's a beautiful country, even though it has a lot of incorrigible badlands and corrigible slums. Aren't many countries have as much in them to look at and wonder about as this one? Cape Cod in the Sierra Nevada. Gloucester and Death Valley. Old Orchard and the Great Plains. Mount Rushmore and Mammoth Cave. Williamsburg and Yosemite. Hot Springs in Georgia and Geysers and Yellowstone. The Florida Keys and the Grand Canyon. The Mississippi and the Hudson and the Columbia. In the final analysis, there can be no analysis. Many a great thinker and poet has attempted it, but the country's too big for any one person. There's Walt Whitman and Willa Cather and Tom Wolfe, and they all felt the magnitude and magnificence of the great nation. They felt it and wrote about it in unforgettable ways. But still, it's bigger than any of them, or any of us. Whitman hit it on the nose when he said it was bigger than the president and his cabinet and the District of Columbia. It's not just Park Avenue or, or Broadway or the Loop or the Strip or the Golden Triangle. It's other things. Many, many, many other things. Steel towns. Farm towns. Mining towns. Wind farms. Ranch houses. Railroad siding. Motels along the interstate. Eighteen-wheelers. Computers! Kettles of sorghum molasses. Gas stations. Sunday papers. Season tickets. Airports. Daycare. Night courts. Radios. Toothpaste. Television. Factories. Dogs. Cats. Video games. Skyscrapers. Guitars. Solar panels. Cemeteries. Subways. Cornfields. Offices. Docks. Hospitals. Oh, we could go on for weeks with this and never come any closer to a working definition of America. How can you add up all the neon signs, the smell of all the bacon and eggs frying in the morning, the bargain specials, the homework assignments, the businesses opening their doors, the cows let in from the pasture, the mileage clocked up on odometers, the rainfall and the snowfall and the wind drift? It's much too great for any person or any party, too much loved by all its people, loved in spite of and because of its faults and virtues and its past mistakes and future promises. America is not a map, a poem, a post of legionnaires, an almanac, a mural, proud towers in New York, or a building in the heart of Washington. It's a territory possessed by people, possessed by an ideal. Well, that's all, listeners. Just wanted to talk between Americans for a little while. No big finish here, no brass section bringing down the curtain. Just a little music to separate me from the announcer, who follows with the closing announcement. <laughs>
You've been listening to Between Americans, an informal program for informal listeners, originally written and directed in 1941 by Norman Corwin, and updated for the 21st century by Norman Corwin and Richard Fish, with additional insights from Emily Labus, Orson Osman, and members of the cast and of the National Audio Theatre Festivals. It was produced, directed, edited, and mastered by Richard Fish, with music created by Chris Holmes. Sound effects were coordinated by Tony Brewer. Voices were recorded by Rex Hunt and members of the cast. Visual effects were created by Tom Curley. Tom Tiggleman and Preston Osman gave technical assistance. Our assistant producer was Tom Dukeman, and Phil Proctor served as associate producer. Heard in the program were the voices of Liraldo Anzaldua, Tony Brewer, Beverly Callender Anderson, Kristen Campbell Proctor, Gladys Devane, Tom Dukeman, Helen Engelhart, Richard Fish, Roel Gorman, Bill Govey, Rex Hunt, Adeline Jones, Dan Lynn, Jason Lopez, Emily McGee, DeAndre Means, Robin Miles, Nathan Morris, Orson Osman, Stephanie Park, Melinda Peterson, Phil Proctor, Barbara Rosenblatt, Gary Sandy, Roy Sillings, George Tirebiter, Isidore James Torrey, and Yolanda Valdivia. The principal role was performed by David Osman. This production was made possible by funding from the National Audio Theatre Festivals, Helen Engelhart, and Tom Dukeman, and special thanks are due to Judith Walcott, the Civic Theatre of Monroe County, Indiana, and Russell McGee. I'm Richard Fish. Thank you very much for listening.